So I'm giving a presentation today on source strength measurements. I've actually moved from Qatar recently, but there's a picture of it anyway. It makes me miss it a little bit. When I was thinking about what to go over this presentation, I could have gone over just delivering the source strength or, or how to measure the source strength only. And we could probably have this entire call in about five minutes. But I thought I would go a little bit deeper. There are some areas that a lot of people globally don't understand really well. And uh, there's some background about air kerma strength and, and source strength uh, that is not only helpful, I think, for brachytherapy, but helps to give a more fundamental understanding to a lot of areas of medical physics. So I'm going to give you a pretty deep overview, and, and near the end, we'll get to more of the uh, basics and, and workflow for actually ensuring that you are uh, measuring your source strength correctly. Okay, so this is an outline. You'll see the same outline at the top of your page, and you'll be able to keep track of where we are within the presentation. So let's start with air kerma strength and a whole discussion based around that. So when we first start about your sources, we'll talk about activity. So the one thing to know about activity is it's very difficult to measure directly, right? Disintegrations per second, different techniques yield different answers. It's not very straightforward. For the treatment planning system, then even if we have activity, you still have to go from activity to dose. This requires conversions and it has some areas for uh, discrepancy as well, which can cause confusion. So it's not a great method um, to use activity only. And you'll see this is the reason why in the recent years we've switched from activity to air kerma strength. So even if you have activity, which we've already said is difficult to measure straightforward, we, we can see how we would go from activity to, to dose. So we'll start with exposure. Well, exposure rate, you remember from your textbooks, is activity um, times the exposure rate constant over distance squared. Now, again, you're Exposure rate constant depends on source construction and encapsulation, which then influences the energy fluence from your source. And it thus can slightly affect how it's measured. So this creates different values. And so the manufacturer could, in theory, use one value. You could pick up from literature or textbook another value, and it causes some errors. So again, it's not a, a great system. However, once you get exposure or exposure rate, it's easy to get to dose. So these two are closely related. So we'll, we'll take a step back and we'll go through a little discussion about exposure. So exposure has a definition and based on that definition, scientists have created tools in order to measure it. So like we do in, in a lot of the world, we see something in the world, and we define it and we decide, how can we design a tool to measure it? That's what we've done with exposure. So exposure is defined as the total charge of ions of one sign produced in air when all the electrons liberated by photons in dry air of mass dm are completely stopped in air. Okay, so that's a lot of words, but basically it's saying in a, in a particular volume, known volume, you radiation, the photons liberate electrons from atoms, and you collect negative electrons to one side of, of the electrode and the positive atoms and ions left over um, to the other side, and that produces a current. So that those charges, if you pick up all those charges liberated, that's exposure. But if you see in this picture, I've got two diagrams. This is an in-air ion chamber, and you can see that shaded area in the picture on the left is your volume. And if you collect all the charges um, liberated in that volume that all stop within that volume, that's your exposure. But as you know, all the charges liberated in that volume won't necessarily stay in that volume. And you can see on the picture on the right, some of the charges leave it to the right. Some of the charges leave it uh, or enter from the left into that volume. Well, what is that? That's basically charge particle equilibrium. So when we say when all the electrons liberated by photons in dry air are completely stopped in air, that's sort of analogous to completely stopped is sort of analogous to charged particle equilibrium. And these two pictures 
sort of show that concept. Okay, so now we've created this device, and if we know the geometry and we know the charge picked up, then we can go directly from exposure, I'm sorry, directly from charge measurement to exposure quite easily with known geometry according to this equation. Not much to it. However, it becomes a little bit trickier as energy increases too much. So if energy increases too much, you see these next two points, the range of the electrons liberated in air must be less than the distance between each collimator plate. So those are the collecting electrodes uh, on the diagram to the left. If electrons liberated by the radiation travel further than that, you're not going to collect those. So that distance has to be less than the range of the secondary electrons. And same with the uh, distance from the diaphragm where the radiation enters to your collecting volume, that shaded region. So if either of those um, distances are less than the range of the secondary electrons, this piece of equipment will, will no longer work properly. And similarly, the beam intensity must remain constant in the specified volume, right? When you start dealing with scatter and attenuation too much, that starts changing your equation. And note that these two points don't hold very well when the energy increases too much. When the energy increases too much, your secondary electron range gets quite large. And that seems to be right around 300 keV maximum photon energy. So that's a, sort of a basic overview of, of one concept of exposure measurement below 300 keV. So we'll go a little bit further. And here's that same diagram that we looked at before. And remember, we've got electrons, secondary electrons on this diagram. They're leaving that central measurement portion. They're exiting to the right. But you've got some that are, enter that are being created outside of that air measurement volume that are entering from the left. Well, that's sort of analogous to the next picture. You've got an air cavity with an air shell, right? It's almost the exact same thing, just slightly different measurement process. Now, if you take it one step further, and if you were able to make something like a solid air shell, well, you could shrink that um, volume even smaller. And that's the idea of graphite um, spherical chambers. Um, so graphite has similar properties to air, not the same, but similar, and it's a solid, so it's much more dense. Again, this exposure equation is the almost identical to the equation on the previous page. The only difference is this 1 over A term. This 1 over A term um, has to do with the amount of attenuation from that solid air shell or the amount of attenuation from that graphite wall. So the chamber's wall, is, the chamber is basically air equivalent, a combination of graphite, which is less than air for the chamber wall, and a set central electrode made of metal, which is greater than air. This combination gives an air equivalence for a particular energy spectrum. Cavity volume has to be accurately known, and the wall thickness of graphite is sufficient to provide charged particle equilibrium. Too small, and you don't read buildup, and the chamber response is low. Too large, and the chamber response is again reduced because it's reached dose maximum and then begins to decrease due to attenuation. And so that 1 over A term accounts for that slight amount of attenuation from the solid wall. And this design can be used for higher energies above 300 keV max photon energy, usually up to about cobalt 60. So these are the two primary measurement devices that standard laboratories around the world will use for accurately measuring exposure. Okay, so now that we see that exposure can be measured quite accurately, let's look at exposure, kerma, collisional kerma, and dose. Uh, so K air is collisional air kerma, is the total energy per unit mass transferred from a photon beam to air. And there's the, question, there's the equation. ETR is the energy transfer, or the sum of the initial kinetic energies of all electrons liberated by photons in a volume, volume of air and dm is the mass, infinitesimally small mass of air in that volume. This sounds quite similar. So if you remember exposure, 
is defined as the total charge of ions of one sign produced in air, right? So, so collisional kerma is the sum of initial kinetic energies of all electrons liberated by air. Exposure is the total charge of ions of one sign produced in air. As you can see, such similar just differences in energy and charge. So you can see exposure is sort of the ionization equivalent of air kerma. You can think of it in that way. There's one more slight note, as you can see I've written, in the, in the definition for, for exposure, dq charge per unit mass, we note that the ionizations arising from the absorption of Bremsstrahlung emitted by the secondary electrons is not included in dq. So that's basically a secondary electron created as part of that exposure is moving with velocity at then creates a Bremsstrahlung. If that Bremsstrahlung then creates another charge, that is not part of the exposure measurement. And you can see that this is only important for high energies. At low energies, there are barely any Bremsstrahlungs created. Um, sorry, there are um, barely any extra ionizations created from Bremsstrahlung from our secondary electrons. You can see for uh, down one paragraph, for cobalt-60 and cesium-137, you only get 0.32 and 0.16% of that response from those charges created from. So it's a very small, small amount. And th those are for higher energies than um, you would even be using for iridium-192 if you have iridium-192. Okay, so that's, that's basically the idea of this page is that kerma is analogous to exposure for lower energies, cobalt-60 or less. And this very last sentence, if we assume that G is negligible, G is the uh, percentage of radiative losses, this is negligible, which we've already said it is for lower energy photons. Kerma equals collisional kerma, right? Because if kerma equals collisional kerma plus radiative, and we've just said that the radiative losses are negligible, then we can say kerma equals collisional kerma. And so for energies up to cobalt-60, dose is equal to collisional kerma. Note that there's only a 0.5% um, difference as specified by the textbook con uh, for energies all the way up to cobalt-60. So cobalt-60 is pushing the limits, but you're still within 0.5% for this basic equation. And so again, the, the idea is that it's quite easy to go from kerma, or I'm sorry, from exposure to kerma to dose. Quite easy and accurate. Okay, the point. Lots of words. Very easy and accurate to measure exposure. It has air kerma for brachytherapy sources. It's easy to change from air kerma to dose. Not so easy to do this with activity. So what do we use? We use air kerma strength, S sub K which is slightly different definition than kerma. Aerokerma strength is, def is defined as the product of kerma rate in free space and the square of the distance of the calibration point from the source center along the perpendicular bisector. Again, a lot of words. It's basically the aerokerma rate at a distance. Usually this is one meter from the source. And we factored out attenuation and scatter within the air. The reason we factor out attenuation and scatter in the air, it takes out that extra variable. So no matter where it is, where this source strength is uh, calibrated, it doesn't matter what the room geometry is, because you're going to factor out the attenuation and scatter within the air. And that makes um, it done at one place the same as doing it at another place. And, and defined at one meter, typically at one meter. So again, we, we will discuss a little bit later how that attenuation and scatter is accounted for in later slides. But one more thing, some planning systems still use activity, so we still need a conversion. Okay. So again, if we take the equation from the previous page and we assume that the radiative losses are negligible, which we've already said we can do for, for low energy photon sources, we get this definition exposure rate uh, times the conversion factor. So exposure rate gives us charge, charge is liberated, and then multiplied by 
W over E. This is your work function for air. It's basically the energy um, per unit charge to make an ionization in air. And then another conversion factor, joules to coulombs. And we see that we get the next equation, exposure rate times 0.876. And then if we want air kerma strength, we'd have to multiply this by the calibration distance, right? By R squared. Note that this is a general formula, formula and we're not talking about free space. So we haven't factored out scatter or attenuation yet. That's just a basic, equa a basic equation. Okay, and we remember from the very first slide that exposure rate is also equal to A gamma over R squared. Uh, if we combine these terms, we get the, the following equation. A okay, very simple equation. And we can see that theoretically, again, without the attenuation scatter removed, we get something 4.11 for your air kerma strength to activity for iridium-192. Okay, but if I look at my source specifications for my my source calibration sheet from the vendor, I can see here's my air kerma rate at one meter. Here's my apparent activity, which means that from the vendor it's 4.07. So this is slightly different. Theory is 4.11, source is 4.07. But again, we note that the theory does not take into account differences in source construction including encapsulation and source geometry, which changes between manufacturers. In addition to this, we excluded the effects of air attenuation and scatter in the theoretical equation, which is included in the exposure measurements, but not in air kerma strength. This has an effect on S sub K. So the apparent activity is the activity of an unshielded source that would give the same exposure rate at a distance of one meter compared with the current filtered source. This all leads to confusion, different values for the exposure rate constant. For any conversions between activity and air kerma strength, always use a vendor specific value, which can be found in the vendor's manuals. So here is a screenshot of my old gamma med system. And I can see that the kerma to activity conversion factor I've entered was 4.07. And this is because on the vendor manual, I get that the Kerma to activity conversion should be 4.07. And this is based on the actual source that I'm using from Varian. Okay, slight differences, but just a little background on theory. Do we have any questions so far? I know that was um, sort of a lot of equations and a lot of information. Uh, oh, we just have, we have one. He asked, which of the values are we, are we entering? Yeah, so we will get to that later in the presentation. Almost all planning systems now should be using air kerma strength, but it will be vendor specific. So I don't know, I won't know your exact where that you'll be using on your computers. Some may still be asking you to enter activity, but Either way, this allows you, this conversion factor from the manufacturer allows you to either use air kerma strength or activity. You would use that value specified from your manufacturer. So in my case with my Varian Gamma Med system, that conversion factor was 4.07. And this is something I can look at with you all as you're um, working on your machine. You can feel free to you know, always send me emails or, or I sent an email with my WhatsApp number, you can WhatsApp me. We can go over it to make sure that you're entering the right value. I'll be happy to be that second set of eyes. So again, it depends on if, you're, if your manufacturer asks for activity or asks for air karma strength. But this value allows you to go between the two. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, he said thanks and yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'll move on to the, the next section. This is about um, calibration laboratories. Again, this is something that not a lot of people know about brachytherapy sources. Uh, most people have a pretty good feel for external beam, but since we're teaching 
source strength measurement. So I think it makes sense to have a, a pretty good idea of where this calibration comes from for your, for your well chamber. Okay, how does your equipment get calibrated? NIST is a United States um, national, national lab or there are equivalent ones in other countries. They use sophisticated equipment to directly measure um, exposure or kerma of a source. We sort of went over this at the beginning, the free air ionization chambers and the graphite cavity chambers, um, ranging in size from small to very big. These are the devices that they use to directly measure um, exposure and kerma. They're quite accurate, so NIST equipment compared to other national labs in other countries, are with, they're all within 0.1 to 0.7% within each other, which is quite good and they subsequently intercompare within their own labs. To go from kerma to air kerma strength, uh, these laboratories need to factor out attenuation and scatter in air, like we said, <clears throat> and multiply by the square of the distance of calibration. Okay, so they can easily get their exposure and kerma from those measuring devices that are quite accurate, they've shown by inner comparison, and then they go from that exposure to kerma to air kerma strength by factoring out attenuation scatter in air and then multiplying by the square of the distance at calibration, usually one meter. We'll show how this, how this is done on subsequent slides. Uh, they then cross calibrate your equipment, your well chamber or your farmer chamber with their equipment to give you a calibration factor. So there are these next two points. For farmer chambers, people end up using the N sub K which is a different definition than N sub SK. So N sub K is a calibration factor, which is uh, kerma per unit current, not corrected for attenuation and scatter in air. So they, they don't do that extra attenuation correction. N sub SK is your calibration factor for air kerma strength per unit current. And this is corrected for attenuation and scatter in air. Okay, so two different definitions n sub k and n sub sk. I'll tell you right now that you'll be using n sub sk for your well chambers. So let's start with cobalt 60. So different people use different sources, cobalt 60 sources, iridium 192 sources. How the national laboratories would do this is they would calibrate a representative source, in this case a cobalt 60 source, as a working standard using open air geometry and the graphite cavity chamber to get a kerma for that source. Note that cobalt-60 calibrations can be carried out with either an external beam cobalt therapy machine or a cobalt-60 brachytherapy source. These have different, the photon fluence is different between these two, right? One is radiating in a spherical manner, the other is more in a conic manner. And so these can lead to differences in your in-error calculations. We'll discuss this later, but it's something just to be aware of if it's ever to be used. They then take more measurements to factor out attenuation and scatter, multiply by the square of the distance to get S of K. Now that they've got an uh, error kerma strength, they can use that to cross calibrate other instruments, including um, those used by ADCLs to calibrate your instruments and give you your own N sub SK, okay? So it's a quite simple way of using a graphite chamber, measure the kerma, factor out the necessary factors, and then use that same source to calibrate other well chambers or farmer chambers, including the well chamber that you'll be using. Now to Iridium-192, should be the same, uh, right? In theory, yes, they should do it the exact same way. In the United States, they actually don't do it this way and it's a very odd reason. There's no funding um, from the United States government to purchase an HDR machine, and that's the whole reason that they don't do it the same way. So they do it in a very, in, in a very sort of archaic way, where they use N sub Ks from two different photon energies, a 250 kVp X-ray and a cesium-137 source, and they use this equation to get their N sub K for Iridium 192. Actually, lots of places around the world have followed the United States and still do it this way. But there are a couple centers, I think, that are now starting to use an actual Iridium 192 source. 
to get their n sub k and then uh, to go from n sub k to n sub s k. But that's sort of a little bit about cobalt 16 and iridium 192. Okay, this is a general overview of in error measurements for S sub K. And, and the point of this, this discussion over in error is just to give a general understanding so that equipment is not misused due to lack of understanding. So lots of people around the world ask the question, why can't we just use our farmer chamber and put the farmer chamber at a certain distance, calibrate it, and use that to measure our, our source strength for our source. And the answer is quite easy why we don't do that, because it's very complex. And so the idea of the next few slides is not to go into the details and, to, and explain to you exactly how to do it, but just to give you an overview of what's going on in these in-error measurements, just so that equipment is not misused. <clears throat> for a thorough review, you can always go to Estro Booklet 8, I have the reference listed at the back of this presentation, as well as the AAPM PowerPoint. Do not attempt in-error calibrations in your department with the former chamber. It's quite complex. Always use a well chamber. If you don't have a well chamber, insist that your hospital administration buys you one um, so that you can do your job um, correctly. Okay. Again, this is a very complicated procedure, so I'll just go over it really quickly. This is basically the formula. I'm using a farmer, and you can see that you've got all these correction factors for air scatter. We won't go into lots of detail, but it's here if you if you want it. Here's again the idea of getting your N sub K for ready 192. Note that you should use a chamber with a flat energy response because the ready 192 has an energy spectrum. Charge collected. Make your corrections. Here's a note which is important. Always make sure to check the standard temperature and pressure on your calibration certificate. The United States uses 22 degrees Celsius for standard temperature. Most everyone else will use 20 degrees Celsius. So depending on where your instruments are calibrated, if you pick the wrong one as your, as your standard, you can be off in your measurements by 0.73%. So always pay attention to this, no matter if it's external beam or brachytherapy. The correction factor for air, there are tabulated values that can be used. For scatter, it's quite complicated. Um, there are two different methods, the shadow shield method. Basically, you take a measurement, then you put a lead shield in front so there's no direct radiation, and you're just looking at scatter around that shield. But it becomes more difficult with higher energies. And then there's this very complicated step and distance technique, which most uh, laboratories would use. Complicated. This is about the different source that was used for the actual calibration, whether it was external beam or a brachytherapy source, again, as a complicated procedure. So let's not use that. Let's use our well chamber. We're finally to measurements in your clinic. Again, so hopefully that was just a, a nice sort of quick background on some of the complexities of air chroma strength and definitions, as well as a brief overview of of some of the work done for the um, calibration process for your well chamber. <clears throat> so now we have your well chamber. And this is quite straightforward. So you've got an equation, your air chroma strength, S sub K, equals your N sub S K. This is directly from your the calibration laboratory. They'll give you this on your certificate, times your uh, raw current measurement. Temperature, pressure corrections, electrometer corrections, and I put P ion and P polarity in there. And we'll go over each one of these individually. Please make sure that your calibration factor, your N sub SK, is valid from the last two years. And if not, make sure that you send it out so that it is. And uh, if you look, some literature will say that your N sub SK by your calibration lab with the same source that you're using. Some literature will, will say that. However, University of Wisconsin, 
who does the majority, or not, maybe not the majority, but probably half the calibrations in the United States. They've done lots of experiments that show that these differences between vendors are within 1%. So it really doesn't matter if you see on the source certificate that the calibration lab calibrated your source with an Electra source, but you're using Varian, it's still within 1% which is within the, the error bars of, of the measurement system. So it's okay if you see a different source vendor on the calibration certificate. However, make sure that the um, N sub SK is for your same radionuclide. So if you're using radium-192, the calibration has to be for radium-192. If you're using cobalt-60, the calibration factor has to be done for cobalt-60. That is important. And this next note, unlike external beam calibrations where the calibration factor was obtained for a different energy, so calibration factors for external beam are done in cobalt-60 beams, and then you, you use them on a megavoltage beam, and thus you have to use P-ion and P-polarity. Because the calibration lab will be using the same source that you're using in practice, the P-ion and P-polarity will be the exact same, right? And so you only use P, I, N, and P polarity corrections if the calibration lab also used those. And you would see this on the source certificate. They would list, say, P polarity of a certain value. If they use that, it means they've used it as part of their own correction factors, and thus you would need to use it in practice. Again, that's more theoretical. In practice, P, I, N, and P polarity are so small for... Uh, brachytherapy sources in well chambers that you can honestly always neglect them and it will be within <clears throat> typically 0.1 or 0.2 percent. That's more of a theoretical concept in practice. You don't really ever need to uh, apply PI on or P-polarity. Temperature and pressure, again, make sure that you've got the right standard temperature. And current is the reading that we take, not charge. Why do we do this? Because of the transit effect. So if you think about it, when the source is going to a certain point, your measurement point, well, the time that, it, that you have the source at that dwell starts as soon as the source reaches that position and then stops as soon as that source leaves that position. Well, as the source is traveling to that position, the source is getting closer and closer to that measurement point and your well chamber is collecting charge as the source is still moving to that point. It sits there at, at the dwell position, and then when it leaves, it's still collecting charge as it's leaving that, that position. That amount of charge that you're collecting is part of the transit effect. So for example, if you have a 0.1 second dwell time, you're going to get still a significant amount of charge, even though the dwell time was barely there. And that's because there's charge being collected as it's traveling to that point and as it's traveling away. And so this makes charge measurements quite difficult because you've always got that transit effect. Charge would work if you use a really, really long dwell time where that transit, transit effect became negligible, but we don't want to spend five minutes at a single dwell position in order to measure our, to take our reading. So we use current. Current is an instantaneous reading and that you no longer have the transit effect. Here's an example of a calibration certificate and things that you can look for. So it serves a radionuclide, make sure that matches your own. Here's the air chroma strength. You can see it reports other things, apparent activity, exposure strength, but you're going to want your air chroma strength at N sub SK. Here's your temperature pressure, where you would see what temperature was used and what pressure was used in the calibration lab for your reference. Um, that would be your standard. Here's the calibration date, valid for two years. Here's information from the secondary lab, including electrometer that was used, as well as the location of the sweet spot. So the sweet spot is the reference position where your source position was within your well chamber. So in this case, it says, 61 millimeters from the bottom of the chamber well. That's where they measured it. 
So if you deviate from that position, you can get slightly different measurements. So this is quite easy. You don't have to measure exactly 61 millimeters up and try and find that position. You just have to find the position in your well chamber with the maximum reading. <clears throat> that maximum reading will correspond to the sweet spot. <clears throat> the manufacturer did the same thing. They, they would measure at a number of different points within the well chamber. When they found the ma maximum reading, that was where they took the calibration. And it just happened to be at 61 millimeters above the bottom of the well chamber. So all you do is take a number of measurements, find that maximum reading, and that's where, that's where you apply your calibration factor. On this document, where are PIM and P polarity? I don't see them listed anywhere here. That means they didn't use them. That means I don't have to use them on my actual um, source strength measurements as well. Again, that's more theory. Um, you shouldn't really ever have to use them. Here's a picture <clears throat> showing how long it takes for the well chambers to get to equilibrium with room temperature. And you can see that it finally reaches equilibrium after actually a few hours. <clears throat> so it's best practice to just leave the well chamber in. The, I usually leave it in the room overnight. And that way, the next day, when I know I'm going to take a well chamber measurement, I know it's at equilibrium with the air temperature in the room. Again, this big difference can throw off your measurements significantly. Uh, allow your electrometer to stabilize, usually about 10 minutes. Um, you can take a number of measurements as well just to get, to, to get it warmed up. Um, so you want to warm up your well chamber. You want to warm up your electrometer. And you want to make measurements in a scatter-free environment as little scatter as possible. So you want to elevate it off the floor. You don't want metallic substances too much, too close by. You want to keep as little scatter as possible. Uh, so you can see my setup. It's suspended um, in the air on a soft chair with mostly air around it, far away from the walls. And I've done the same setup and compared it to setups with just big styrofoam blocks and I get the same result. So I, I know that's a pretty good setup. So just try and keep it in as little scatter as possible because that's how your calibration laboratory did it. Okay, so quality assurance for your measurement system. <clears throat> Note that well chamber readings can drift over time like any chamber. So you should be checking for consistency of the reading. There are two approaches to check for consistency of your well chamber electrometer system. The best approach is if you have a long lift source like a cesium-137 check source of low activity, uh, you can put this check source in on a whatever, a daily, weekly, monthly basis and just check for consistency of readings. And, and that's the simplest, best approach to just check for stability of your well chamber electrometer system. An alternative approach, if you don't have a long lift check source, is to actually use your HDR machine that you, that you have. So you can use the same source, correct it for decay, how long it's been since your last measurement, and you should have a theoretical reading that you should have. If you do that, if you take the measurement again, it should agree with your previous reading. And that's a, a nice constancy check for your entire electrometer and well chamber, both of them together. So I would typically do this before source exchange. So before I put in a new source, I want to make sure that I don't have any issues with my well chamber and electrometer. So I'll take a measurement of my old source, which is about one half life old, and I'll see with with decay corrections that I get the same result as I did, you know, three months ago. If I get this, the same result, then I know my well chamber electrometer are working fine. I'll go ahead and do the source exchange and I'll measure my new source. Okay, so that's a nice alternative approach to checking your electrometer and chamber consistency. Now we get to the Excel sheet. So Ryos Cluster Cancer is providing you with a, an Excel sheet for measuring your your source exchanges, and I'll give a, a live demonstration shortly, but this is for your use. You can tweak it um, as needed to fit your 
positions. This is for a gamma med system. You'll need different dwell positions for a different system if you're not using gamma med. Some slight differences here and there, which you can change, and I would be happy to help review any of those changes you make at your center. Okay, so, so a quick overview. You've got machine information on the top, sources and instruments information in the next section, and then data collecting and processing in this big middle section. And then comments at the end. It's always good to comment on everything that you do. That way when you go back in, in future months, you can look back and know exactly what happened on that day. Okay, so if we look at the measurement section, here is the time and date of the actual measurement, along with measurement positions and readings in current. And if we plot these two, position versus current reading, you can find your sweet spot. We're looking for the maximum reading. So at this position, in my particular system, I see that at a distance of 1252, I got the maximum reading. That's my sweet spot. This is where I position my source in order to take um, to apply the calibration factor. All right, and that automatically transfers over in your Excel sheet. Um, next, you've got a timer linearity check and timer error check. If you plot these values, you're just taking diff at that sweet spot. You take measurements reading of charge at different amounts of time and you plot it. You plot it, you see that we have a linear plot. Okay, so it's linear. That's the first thing that we're checking. The next thing that we're checking is uh, timer error. So you can see at time equals zero, we have a reading. That's saying we have dose with no time. At dose equals zero, we have a negative time. This is our timer error, this whole concept of, of transit that we talked about before. So the dose accumulates as the source travels to and away from the dwell position. This is your timer error. Okay, we'll do a quick live demonstration. So I will open up my Excel sheet. Again, you would type in all your own information from your source certificate up here. You would use your values from your electrometer and chamber here with your calibration factors that you would plug in. Here's the date and time of the actual um, measurement. Here you would put in your positions in order to try and find the sweet spot. Um, these positions will differ for your machine if you don't have a gamma med. And you'll take measurements and you'll see that you've gone up in reading as we have and then back down in reading. If you don't see it going up and down, you haven't quite hit the sweet spot. So you'll have to move these positions again. Okay? You want to see the readings increase and then decrease. You want to find a maximum in order to know that you've hit the sweet spot. So in this case, the maximum reading was 43.17. It transferred over. Everything in blue, you fill out. Everything in pink is calculated directly for you. Okay, so you just find the sweet spot. It brings it over here. It does an automatic decay correction, an automatic temperature pressure correction, and it spits out a measured air chroma strength here and an air chroma strength here, decayed from the manufactured date. It does that all automatically for you. Here, you're measuring charge, uh, a charge reading versus a number of time taken at the sweet spot, and it does all this measurement for you and spits out a timer error. <clears throat> Every time you see one of these little red things, you'll see that there's a note, and it shows um, additional instructions in case you've forgotten something. So here, in case you've forgotten, it says we use charge here because we are trying to see the amount of charge or dose that is collected during transit of the source from the first dwell position. Okay, so you got these little notes everywhere. This explains when you would use PI on, P polarity, when you would not. So we've put all these nice little notes in so that there's no confusion about where you're taking measurements or why. Okay, on this particular sheet, this is just for gamma med users. Um, if you're not, you can ignore this. So we choose a, a date for our activity or air chroma strength at noon on that particular day. That's just a, a varying gamma med thing. Okay, and then a place for 
comments here. Does anyone have any questions over uh, this calibration sheet? Again, I'll be happy to check your results the, the first uh, time that you use this sheet to make sure that um, you're understanding it properly. I usually look at plus or minus 2%. I've, I don't think I've ever been off by more than 2%. I think international guidelines say if you're within plus or minus 5%, you're okay. Usually if it's if I see it more than 2%, I'll recheck my setup and, and do it again. The other thing is I will input the source activity from the source certificate, not the measured one. So I just check that I'm within 2%, but then I'll still use the source activity from the certificate. So make sure you see anyone typing in any questions. Uh, nope, not yet. Okay, so I will continue on. And this Excel sheet should be supplied to you. If you don't have it, um, ask me or us to make sure we'll give it to you. And again, I'll be happy to check your work as you implement this into your own clinic. Uh, let me show you one more thing on the Excel sheet, sorry. So after the Excel sheet, it automatically auto-populates decay tables. This decays once per day. Uh, we can slightly modify it depending on your system. This one's set up for gamma med. I've got one at my clinic right now for Nucleotron. I've made them slightly differently, but I'm happy to go over that with you as well. And the rest of these are for gamma med machines, which I, I won't go over right now. Okay, we are almost done. You can see on the top, we're, we're on the last section, TPS and uh, treatment planning systems and console. So now that you've measured your source strength to be within 2% of the, of the manufacturer's specification, you need to input that source strength into both your treatment planning system and your treatment console and any other QA documents that you have, like a printout of the decay that you keep on your wall, any Excel sheets, that sort of thing. Um, you need to understand how your system works and pay attention to dates, okay? Examples, at the console, variant decays the source once per day at midnight. So what strength would you wanna use for 24 hours? The strength at midnight, at noon, other. When I use variant, gamma med, we used a time um, at noon. We had it decay once per day um, for the source strength at noon every day because that was closest to our treatment times. Nucleotron or Aleta, they use exact time at the TPS. Now at the TPS, variant uses a nominal source strength of 10 curies. Electa uses actual activity. So know these, know these differences. <clears throat> Pay attention to units, double check, triple check, independent check. Again, I'm happy to look at units. Same with our other RCC volunteers. We're happy to look at this information for you. You should update your source information everywhere. So as soon as you measure your source, Update it in the treatment planning system, update it in your delivery console computer, update it in Excel sheets, the decay table posted on your wall, any daily QA plans, etc. Here are just a couple examples. So here's my variant TPS. You can see calibration values are entered in there in one way for variant. Here's a nucleotron TPS and air primer strength and calibration date and time have been entered here. So now we go to the console for Nucleotron. Make sure that they agree. Same for Varian. We would go input in the console. You see from the TPS, it's the, <coughs> they would be the same values. So again, Varian is slightly different. So in the TPS, you have to, input a nominal 10 curie source. But for example, I can see here in the serial number for this source, uh, this value here um, corresponds to the date. So that says June 3rd, 2019, which is here. And the activity, this is actually 13.258 millicuries, which you can see here. So again, the whole no. point is, yeah. 
Come and read the volume of this thing. I want to read this. Okay, okay, perfect. But the whole point of this slide is just to make sure differences in TPS, how you do it, but make sure that your console matches your TPS as soon as you take your measurement. <clears throat> uh, here's another really good resource, which I would highly recommend. itreatsafely.org, which one of my closest friends developed. It's a great resource. Um, it's free. They have lots of instructional videos. And for this lecture, they have instructional videos on HDRQA. So if you just go to itreatsafely.org, you create your free login, then you go to videos, you can search. And if you search HDR source exchange videos, you can watch step-by-step -step video tutorials of exactly how to do source exchange. It's really, really helpful. So I would highly recommend um, watching these videos. And they have lots of other information on the same site. It's a great free site. And here are my uh, references that you can also look at if you want uh, a deeper understanding of any of the aspects of this lecture. I covered a lot of information, I know. Does, are there any questions or any aspects that aren't really clear? Again, I was trying to give you sort of a, a thorough but brief background on activity, exposure, kerma, dose, as well as how you're getting those calibration values from your laboratories, and then how you apply those in practice with the Excel sheets given to you by Rios Conscious Cancer. Any questions over anything? There aren't any questions in the chat, but there is a note that it says that they're using a saggy Nova. Okay, I'm actually not familiar with that, but I'm sure that we can still help you through any processes or any questions that you have. The concepts are all, all the same, so I will be happy to help. My colleagues will be happy to help if you have questions in implementing uh, the Excel sheet for your source strength measurements or if you have questions on um, inputting anything into uh, your TPS or your, or your console. We, we're happy to help. And if there are no more questions, I'm going to get back to my clinic here. Um, but it was a pleasure to um, um, speak with you all this morning. And I hope not just this lecture, but all the lectures um, um, in this program have been helpful in, in your uh, work with HDR brachytherapy, uh, where you are. OK. Thank you everyone so much and thanks Samiksha for helping out with us today as well. Of course.